Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon to you all and thank you for joining us today. Every year during Web, University Development organizes a lecture series featuring prominent leaders and professionals from the kingdom. These individuals have been instrumental in shaping the business outlook within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and beyond. Our guest speaker today is engineer Ghassan Merdad, the vice president and general manager of Schlumberger Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Engineer Merdad has over 18 professional years of experience within the company, with 13 years of international assignment across Egypt, Bolivia, Brazil, Pakistan, Dubai, Malaysia, and Paris, and including assignment in Saudi Arabia. During his career in Schlumberger, Engineer Merdad has held several significant positions in the field, line management, operations, and HR. We are delighted to have Engineer Merdad with us today for his speech on the global experience. Please help me in welcoming Engineer Ghassan Merdad. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Excuse me, I just came out of a surgery, so I, I might move like a robot for you, you know. Um, I work in the oil and gas, and as mentioned, uh, most of my experience is out of, out of Saudi Arabia. And I will not show you tons of slides in my presentation. It's just a few slides. And I don't want to um, show you the... Uh, you know, what a leader, a good leader to be, what do you have to do. What I wanted to do something that is different. I wanted to tell you where I worked and during my, my different, you know, journey in different countries where I worked, there is a lot of things that I did wrong and there is some things that I did right. And I learned from these things and I just wanted to pass because this is the real, real experience that you go through. Now, maybe it will be linked to things that you see in books and presentations, but it it comes from a, from a story more than, you know, what to do and what not to do. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm a normal person who does a lot of mistakes as well. The idea is, is how to learn from your mistakes and make sure you don't, you know, duplicate or make them more. Now, of course, when you, when you go on your young career and you do the mistakes, it's a lot better than doing them at a, at a higher level because the impact can be huger. Before I start, I would like just to give you a bit of a, a bit of snapshot about oil and gas, just to know where I'm coming from and what sector I do, what do I do. So usually, if you ask anyone about oil and gas, but people know majority, if they're not in that sector, the price of oil is what, $100? It dropped to 50 Are we doing good or not doing good? Today, the, the people talk about shale gas is the, everyone that's talking about shell gas, or in Arabic they call it al Ghaz al-Sakhri. But just to give you a broader perspective about it, in the oil and gas we have three, three sectors. You have the upstream, where, where I fit, where Shlomajay fits and my complete job is. You have the midstream where after, after we drill for oil, we try to find oil, try to extract oil or gas, then it goes to the midstream where you have the facilities where the refineries and all of the byproducts starts coming in and at the end where they sell oil or they you know go into the fuel where you go and you fuel your car at the end of the day so yet you know when i say upstream it still is a big uh, is a big high level so i'm going to zoom in what do we do in upstream from a slumberj perspective so the first thing we do is seismic What we do is usually you have a piece of land or in the middle of the ocean that you don't know if there is oil or not. You need to know where to drill. So what we do is we do seismic. What seismic is, either in land we have these huge vibrators that vibe and create sound, or in the sea we have these huge boats that have streamers that have explosives on them and they create this kind of sound that migrates within the water to the seabed in, into the... Um, to the, uh, to the ground, be it on land or in the sea. And as you know, the sound waves, they bounce back. 
depending on different layers that they, they penetrate. We, in Shlomo J, and in the upstream operation, we analyze this, whatever comes back. And according to our analysis, what we can tell you is there is certain amount of layers that you have down, and la layer X, 90%, there is oil or gas, or maybe nothing. But from our experience in oil and gas, under this layer, there is usually hydrocarbon. So then our clients, who are the operators, you know, Saudi Aramco, Shell, BP, ExxonMobil, then they decide where to drill, what to drill. But still, there is a huge uncertainty of actually finding oil and gas. So they go and they drill. And as you see in this picture, you usually think we drill only vertical. Actually, we drill vertical and then we go 90 degrees. And we don't go, you know, uh, well, you know, 100, 200 meters. We go, you know, 4, 5, 10 kilometers this way. So a lot of very high sophisticated tools that we use during drilling. After we drill, we have different tools that goes in the hole and takes samples, takes logs, and analyzes what kind of, you know, hyd uh, nuclear, what kind of hydrocarbon that you have. Is it water, is it oil, it's gas. Between the drilling tools and between the reservoir catalyzation tools, what happens is we come to a model and we analyze and we then we decide what, what to do next. Is it a reservoir? Is it an important reservoir? Do we have a discovery? How big is the discovery? Because sometimes you land on a discovery, but it's, a small, it's very small. Or sometimes it's very heavy oil that you cannot extract. So all of this adds to the equation. Once this is done, you have the third element that we have, it's called the production, where we try to extract as much as possible from downhole. Either we pump acid or we put pumps, different methods we perforate to increase the amount of oil that comes in. With this, you have the full cycle. This is what we do in Shlambaje. This is, in a nutshell, what we do in Shlambaje. From the time of searching for oil to the time we have the oil ready, to be extracted and to go down to downstream where all the refiners are. Now having said this, we go straight to the topic. This is a slide that was developed by the company at one point of time when I was in Paris. And it was mainly discussing the, uh, how we develop uh, engineers in the company from a geographical and department. The way we do, we move people around from country to country to get experience. You deal with different clients, with different environment, with different employees. But at the same time, we, we move people or employees from department to department. One day you're in the field, one day you're in HR, one day you're in operation management, one day you're in marketing and sales. And with this, you get acquainted with all of the department and then you come to your country and lead and manage your country. So I'm, as you know, I'm Saudi. I've been recruited from Saudi. I graduated from King Fahad University. And as soon as I graduated, I went to Egypt. So I'm going to talk about different stories in each country that I went to. And due to time, you know, I'm trying to pick and choose the stories that really can add value to you in your career today or hopefully in the future. As you know, there is a lot of times that we talk and we say it's very important to know your team. It's very important to know their strengths, their weaknesses. It's all yes. But what I'm going to tell you today is a bit beyond knowing a normal things and part about your employees. So I arrived to Egypt after one year. And in Egypt, not in Egypt, in Shlombaje, you, you stay in the field for three years. These three years, you get very fast having responsibilities, having a team reporting to you. And then after the three, four years, you move to management. So after one year, came to the office. Manager came and told me, Ghassan, we have 10 new field specialists. Field specialists are employees who graduated from a two-year diploma. He says, we have 10. You're going to be in charge of them. Make sure they get trained and up to speed. And you will be their tutors. I said, fine. I went, gave them the HSE briefing, took them out in the yard, went around, taught them a lot of things on the equipment that we have. And then during lunchtime, I said, guys, I invite you for lunch. They looked at me, 
while we're walking to the, uh, to the changing room to change our coveralls. And you can see one by one, find me an excuse to leave. You know, one said, I have to bring my passport, I have to bring my application, I have to call my family. So I remember after, out of ten, four managed to find an excuse to leave. I didn't know why, I just felt, you know, they really have an excuse to leave. By the time we changed and went to, to the car, or I would say pickup, we used to have the pickups to go to the field, another three left. Okay. Then, just at the car, just, you know, jumping in the car, another two left. There's only one who's left from the ten. Now, I think he felt embarrassed that he can find another excuse because everybody left, so he just jumped in the car and said, let's go. So I said, where would you like to eat? And he said, anywhere. I said, look, there is Pizza Hut, there is McDonald's, there is Kentucky, there is Mu'min. Mu'min is a, is a shawarma, shawarma place that's very famous in, in, in Egypt. And he said, Hassan, you choose. And of course, you know what we have in the Arab culture. No, no, you have to choose. No, no, you have to choose. And we've been arguing this back and forth. And I insisted that he chooses. And guess what he told me? He said, Hassan, can I say something? I'm driving the pickup. And I said, please, go ahead. He said, Hassan, I never had enough money to eat in these restaurants. You know, it was a wake-up call for me. It was a shake. The person never had enough income to eat in these restaurants. The point I wanted to say, you know, it's good to know the, 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 the strength of your team. It's good to know how to delegate to who, who works with who, what's the strength of this person in this part, and make sure you, you, you delegate the way you want to delegate. But going beyond this, going beyond knowing the strengths and weaknesses, knowing his personal family and understanding his issues, family issues, how many kids he have, all of this is very, very, very important. Because there is a lot of times that an employee would have, for example, his son is sick. And I'm, I might be exaggerating right now because we work in the oil and gas where people go and they disappear for three weeks, one month before they come and see their family. So for me, it's very important to know this. That's when you can decide a lot of things. Because, for example, if his son is sick and you send him to a job which is a month, do you think he'll do a good job? He won't be focused. Now, you might say this applies in all kinds of jobs, but I really think once you are close to your team and knowing your team, beyond knowing their strengths and weaknesses, it's very important because it builds this relationship between the manager and his employees. Another story that I had in Egypt as well is, is you need to know as a manager is to communicate your decisions. Because sometimes your employees don't know why you decided this. And sometimes they disagree with you. So I went, this was after two years, two years, three years in Egypt. I was sent to a well site. You know, I, I, after yesterday's presentation, I said maybe I should have had pictures so people can understand. So it was, you can imagine a desert. And there is this huge tanks around a well. Usually when we go and operate, we go with 40, 50 people. So I went as the lead engineer. I arrived at the location, and I should have 50 crew members, and there was nobody. It was only me. I handed over with the person who was in charge. He said, Rassam, we have a problem in the well. That is not our fault, but we have a problem. The expert is coming from Aberdeen. It's going to take him two weeks, maybe three, to come. By the time get visas, ship equipment, to come and solve the problem. Because this is, a, is not a normal problem, and we don't have this technology to solve this. I said, fine. The guy leaves. And you can imagine, I am considered an international employee in Egypt, of course. And I'm sitting in this desert. The first day I went, looked at the files, you know, read what's happened for the last couple of days. And then, you know, I just felt there is nothing to do. Now, usually in the field, in the oil and gas, when you go and sleep, you sleep in bunk beds. So you're two or four together in the same room. Usually you don't have internet. That time there was no mobiles. And the food is either chicken or rice 
or rice and chicken. <laughs> I'm a bit exaggerating, I think, but it's almost like that. So, so what happened in my case, because I was the lead engineer, it was a different case. I had my office, I had my own room, I had internet, and I had an international line. In that days, it was the chatting days, you know, when started chatting. So I had everything, right? Not only this, every day I'm in the field, I'm being paid bonus for being there. So imagine, no work, doing nothing, having all of the luxury that usually you don't have in the field, and being paid, other than your salary, a daily bonus. Can't be better than this, no? So what happens is, a day, two, three, then I called my boss. He was, he was Mexican. And I said, Chief, I need to go back. And I tell you, he was not happy. You don't want to work. You just arrived. You want to come back. Now, being a Hijazi, you know, you know from the eastern, from the western province in Saudi, you know, we're hot, right? So, what do you mean? You know, I'm trying to save you money. Get me back. I said, you don't need me here because I'm not doing anything that makes any sense. Send me back and bring anyone who's young who can sit down because there is nothing to do. You can have more output from me to go do something else and generate, you know, do something that can generate and send someone here who can sit and watch the equipment till the professional comes, then you can bring me. And we had this, you know, three to four minute argument on the phone where I was really, which was wrong, aggressive and trying to, you know, say my point because I thought I was trying to save the, save the company money. Even though it's my pocket at the end of the day, I was still trying to save the company money. And he, for, for after three, four minutes, he listened to me, and he understood my, where, where I'm coming from. So he asked, he said, Ghassan, the, the client drilled the well and has a problem in the well. I said, yes. It's not our problem. I agree it's not our problem. It's something else. But our equipment is at the well site. And the client is not paying hundreds, he's paying millions of dollars for equipment sitting doing nothing. So he, said, he asked me this question, what do you think I should do for a client who's paying me millions? Should I send a lead engineer expert in front of him just to see that I am committed? Or I send someone, you know, just to watch equipment till the expert comes? You know, at that time, I realized I only saw my circle. I only saw the small circle that I'm trying to save the company money. You know, I can do something better somewhere else. But I didn't see the big picture that my manager saw. My commitment, our, our commitment as a company to our client. At the end of the day, he's paying millions. Then I need to give you the right people at the field, even though there is a problem. This, as a young engineer, I didn't see. But if the manager did not explain this to me, I would have never understood it. I would have said, you know, he's taking you know, a decision himself and wasting money, fine. I'm making a lot of money, I'm sitting, I'm happy, fine. But taking the time and explaining is very, very important. At the same time, you know, when you're a new graduate, you're full of energy and you want to do things and you see something that is wrong, but you, as well, you didn't see the big picture. So I would say this works both ways, from a leader to, to explain, but from a, a young person who's in the organization needs to be patient and trust some decision that management are, being, are taking. After Egypt, I was so lucky, I went to Latin America to Bolivia. Can't complain. And in Bolivia, of course, a guy from Mecca goes to Bolivia, doesn't speak a word of Latin, Spanish. I go there, I arrive, in the first week, the manager opens, I remember he had my file, he says, Rasan, your file says HPHT, HPHT in the gas means high pressure, high temperature. It's, you know, when you go to wells that are very sophisticated, which I used to work a lot in Egypt. So he says, Rasan, it says HPHT, gas wells, with H2S, which is poisonous gas. You know, these are the tough things that... He says, it has this your experience, so we have a job that you're going to take care of. Fine, okay. So I went. This is my first couple of days. And I went prepared. I was a bit worried because nobody speaks English, except my crew speaks English. 
But I didn't know the client speaks English or not. First time in the country, you're new to the organization there. So anyway, I don't see anything wrong with that. Do you see anything wrong? Nothing wrong. The guy saw your experience, told you to take the lead, fine. One thing that we have in our organization in Schlumberger is to get promoted, there is requirements. You do one, two, three, you get promoted. Four, five, six, you get promoted. But one of the things, there's a term called breakout. Breakout means that you go to the well site, you get in charge, you do the job under supervision, and then who is supervising you comes back with the report, and if you pass, you get promoted. Now, apparently, this job was assigned for someone his breakout. And Mr. Hassan arrives and takes over. You start, you know, you start this hate relationship from day one in an environment that you're not comfortable with. You don't know. And it's not my fault at the end of the day. I didn't choose to be in charge of the job. So again, we go to the pickup, and this guy who was supposed to be in charge, very upset, doesn't want to talk to me, sitting next to me, and, and we're driving, you know, 12 hours, middle of the jungle. And of course, a lot of things come out, Saudi, you know, Bolivia, what do you do, what we do, and different things come up. And then, you know, I told them, I like, personally, I like to teach, I like training. So I told them in Egypt, I used to be in charge of promotions because I, I like to look at training and see what's missing and see who, what's missing what and how can I make sure I fill up the gap. So he told me, you know, I was supposed to go for a breakout. I said, when? He said, this job. Nobody told me about this. Yeah, and, but I can see, I started to see. He said, well, it was assigned to my breakout. I said, then what happened? I, said, I don't know. Excuse me. He said, uh, I was told that you're in charge. And straight, you know, you can see friction. That I, you know, you start sensing that there is something wrong. So I told them, um, what's wrong that you continue doing the, the breakout? You know, you know the smile? The smile comes up to, up to here. He says, what do you mean? I said, you do the breakout. I said, the client doesn't speak English, and I don't speak any Spanish. So you need to talk to the client. So that's one tick. You're talking to the client. You're in charge. You talk to the client. You take care of the equipment. You know you're preparing it anyway before I arrived. Take care of the equipment. I will just stay on the side and watch. All I know is how to cook burgers. That's what my term usually when I say, look guys, when I go with you for a breakout, I cook burgers. I'm very good at that, but that's it. Now I can help you if you do something wrong, I'll help you. But you need to take the lead. So anyway, the person took the lead, did very well, came back with a report, and he got promoted. The, the idea of the story is, sometimes you are put in a position that is not your fault. But yet, it can cause friction and hate in your organization. What, what do we usually say? It's not my fault. He decides, not me. Why should I go and explain? Why should I do this? What? There is nothing wrong that we talk and communicate and help each other at the end of the day. Even though it's not your mistake. You are put in a position that you have nothing to do with. Not your fault at all. But we have this ego that says, why should I go and talk about it? Why should I, the one who has, I have nothing to do with it. Ego is lethal. I think in any organization. Sometimes it's, it's good to have, but you really need to manage the ego. After, um, after Bolivia, I went to Brazil. Day one in Brazil, I had, I was an engineer, still an engineer. So I have myself, I have my manager, and N, N plus 1, N plus 2. Literally a manager above me, five managers above me. The manager of all Latin America. Or this department that I used to work with. Day one, I arrived to Brazil. I put my bag. And I come in to this. It was 6 o'clock afternoon. And 
I don't want to go to the details of the story, but he decided something that is very bad in my behalf. Extremely bad. Not being fired, but I'm saying something that really I was, I didn't expect, and I was not, it was, it was the wrong decision. Now, I could have sat down and explained to him, your decision, I think, you know, there is misunderstanding, and I explained to him the, why the things look wrong. But again, I am Hijazi. I am from the Western province. You know, so we have this ego sometimes that we go and fight. Literally, I got to a complete confrontation. Shouting. Name whatever you want to name how I went. I went complete because I knew I was right. You know, sometimes you are right, but of course, because of the decision he made was completely wrong, so I could not even argue or talk or discuss. I just went. And, and with me was a couple of managers. My managers were there. And they said, Hassan, this is normal. I said, Chief, it's normal for you, not for me. I mean, let's be very clear. My bags are packed, and I have a return ticket. So either I go back, this will not apply to me. Now, the problem is what? When I say the story, and if you know the details, you'll tell me, Hassan, you are 100% correct. And I was 100% correct. Where was I wrong? Is my bad attitude in communicating. And that's why, till today, I say the story to all of the young engineers when they recruited. It was my fault. It was my mistake, regardless the guy, the, this manager decided a decision on some information that he knows. I need to have the time to sit, explain that this information is not right. Yet, no, I didn't. Great confrontation, not going to happen with me. I don't like, I don't care. You don't want me, I fly out. Now, I knew because he was the manager of Latin America. He had a lot of good feedback from my job that I did in Bolivia. But chief, being good doesn't mean anything. We are, you are in a professional organization. You talk professionally and, and, and work professionally. You can be very good, technically very strong. But if you don't be professional in the way you talk, the way you work, and you communicate with respect, regardless if you are wrong or right, there is professionalism in the way you talk and communicate. Not to mention, you know, you're, I'm a young engineer talking to a big chief. You know, you insult, I insulted him in front of his whole team. What do you think? You know, he will say, uh, come on, listen to you. No, of course not. If you recall, I told you, we stay in the field three to four years. And then you move to management. I stayed six because of that. I say the story to everyone, I blame myself. It was completely my mistake. And I tell the guys, you have to spend time to explain sometimes. I can, you know, at the beginning when I used to, when I had this problem, I used to tell everyone, the story is so and so, so I'm right. Everybody says, yes, you're right. But I don't continue the story the way my, I reacted, and the way I communicated, and the way I talked, with complete disrespect, which is not acceptable by any means. Now, at that time, I thought I was right. But once you mature, you start understanding. The mistake was mine. If I sat down and explained, it was, Brazil was heaven, was excellent. The team was good, my, manager, my direct manager was good, the client was good. But this person made my life miserable. He used to call from Rio de Janeiro, calls, where is Rassan? Allah Rassan is working in the shop. No, no, send him to the jungle. Send them offshore. Anyone from Brazil here? No? There's a city called Mossoró. It's right on the tip here. Middle of nowhere. Send them to Mossoró. Okay. Sorry, it's on the side. Sorry, it's up here, actually. So all I'm saying, you know, this is very, very communication is very important, the way you communicate. We are, we are professionals. We have to watch out. Even if you're not wrong. Even if you're 100% correct, you really need to know how to, to 
to know how to communicate. Sorry, I'm getting dragged with time, you know, so I have to go faster. So after that, Brazil, I don't know what went wrong, but I went to Pakistan. <laughs> you know, you have a culture shock going, and then a culture shock, reverse culture shock going back. Having said that, Pakistan was an excellent assignment. It was my first time to be a manager. All of this, in the past, I was still a field engineer. I managed two, three, from two to three, up to 40 team members in a crew. When I go and do a job and come back, they don't report to me. We, I, they just report to me during the operation and then we go back. Here, I moved and I became first line manager, but I was the country manager for Pakistan for three departments in Islamabad, three companies in Islamabad. And loads of mistakes and loads of good things that I did. But again, due to time, I just have to shrink to things that are very important. So one thing is you need to make sure as a manager, make sure his expectations are very clear. And if you promise, you deliver. So what happened to me, I went to a city called Khaskeli. BP works there. And I went there and I saw the team. I met my, my, my crew. And I saw one guy. So we have three levels. We have engineers. We have field specialists who are diploma holders. And then we have operators who are high school and below. And usually high school and below, they are the hard workers, right? They're, you know, they, they're workers. They stay in the field. So I saw this guy. He was an operator, grade four. Engineer starts at grade eight, field specialist grade seven. So he's a grade four, so he's big difference between him and a field specialist. But when I saw him at the well site, I was visiting a well site as a manager, and the guy was running the show himself. Wait, you're an operator, yes. And you're running the whole show yourself. Yes, talking to the client, doing the maintenance, getting things, everything. So I looked to the manager of that location, and I said, uh, Chief, you're underpaying this guy. And he looked at me, he said, what do you mean? I said, this guy is doing a job of field specialist. He's an operator. So I called the guy and I said, if you get promoted straight to field specialist, so you're going to jump from four to seven, three grades. It was like heaven opened for him, you know. So I told him, this is what's going to happen. He was very happy, very thankful. You know, I appreciate. I mean, so I went back, gave the instructions to, to the HR organization, do the promotion. And everything went fine. Everything was going okay. Then I get a call from, not a call actually, the manager was visiting after three months. And he came, was, you know, updating me on operation. And then he tells me, Rasan, there is one problem. He says, you know, the, the team is saying, you know, maybe you promise and you don't deliver. And I said, what do you mean? So he told me the story. The guy didn't get promoted. They have clear instructions to get the promotion. Why he didn't get promoted? Anyway, as usual, in the system, usually sometimes you have hiccups. And I never thought to follow up on it personally, or actually delegate someone to follow up on it. I just send an email and thought it's going to happen. But a small mistake like this, your whole team will lose trust in you. I meant from my bottom of my heart that I wanted to promote the guy. I really wanted to promote the guy. But I did not make sure it's done. And I learned one thing. Actually, and two things. One, I was very happy that someone from the field would come and tell me, Hassan, you're not delivering on your promise. For him to tell me this, at least I feel comfortable that someone can come and talk to say this to me, which is very good. But one thing is, you need to set expectation because you need to put in your head that sometimes things go through the crack. So instead of promising him next month, you do this, you're going to be promoted. Say, look, I'm going to work on your promotion. I'm going to do my best. And be, maybe better not to tell him grade 7. Just say promotion. And then he sees the grade 7, which is, right? And the big part on me is I didn't follow up or dedicate someone to make sure he follows up on this. Him or her to follow up on this, on this, uh, this action. 
I mean, Pakistan has a lot of stories, but due to time, is I need to, to move on. So I went to Dubai, and I was the training manager for Middle East and Asia. So I used to cover all the way from Australia, all the way to Libya. Anything that concerns training, development, staffing, moving people from place to place, recruiting people, it was under my organization. And my manager was a Chinese, very good guy. Uh, if, after him, a Turkish person came. This Turkish person, he's the one who identified me in Egypt. I never knew him, but I got to know later on. He's the one who sent me all the way to Latin America. And he's the person who sent me all the way back to Pakistan, which I, you know, at the beginning I didn't like, but he was good. And then he became my manager in Dubai. And one day I came from vacation and he told me, by word, he said, Rassan, don't work. Go spend this four days vacation, and I don't want you to see emails from you, nothing. So I did what I was told. The day I came back, I opened the door, he reamed me. You don't answer your phone calls, you don't reply to your email. He's a very good guy, by the way. He's one of the people I very respect. He retired, and I, I have a lot of respect to this person. But I'm just telling you the story. So he comes and gives me hard time. Everybody's complaining. So imagine, in every country, there is managers all over this area. They all call me for people. They all call me for, you know, uh, either people or moves or whatever. You know, I have operation increased. I need more people. Some people telling me, transfer this people from... So there is a lot of things that needs to be done. So I was, I was upset, but I remember Brazil time that I have to be calm. Get your facts together. I went down and he told me, everybody's complaining, all the managers are complaining. Da, da, da. So I went down and I made a list of all the field people. We're talking about a thousand employees. I made a list of all the managers. That's another all, I mean all kind of managers. That's another 400 employees. And then the, the VPs that reports to my boss. That's another maybe 10, 15. We were talking 1,500, 1,400 population. So I went to him and I said, Alp. He called me. I, I, he called me and said, I'm, I'm free right now. I'm going to come. Come upstairs. So I went upstairs with this sheet. And he said, everybody's complaining. What's going with this case? So I said, this case, blah, 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 blah. What about this case? And I, I, I had everything in line for all the cases that he wanted to ask me. I was okay. And I told him, Alp, look. Just to let you know, the population that I work with and I talk because I'm in charge of every promotion, every person who wants to get a promotion has to come to me. So I told them field 1,000, managers 300, VPs another 15. All of these want to call me every day. They want to respond the same day. And he realized that I was right. So next time he had a conference call, gave a hard time to all the managers saying, guys, you know, you just complain, just, you know, how much population that wants to talk to Hassan, and he supported me. But the thing he told me after that call is what's important. He says, Hassan, very important. You can, you can argue, you can discuss, you can see me fight, not fight, but I'm saying tension, but you never burn bridges. You want to be successful, Never burn. You can hate the person. Hate is out of work. Love, hate, relationship is out of work. Work, professional, and never burn bridges. Which was one thing that I really took and continued with me. After Dubai, this Alp said, Rassan, of course, I've been nine years, never worked in Saudi. So everyone, there's a lot of rumors that I'm going to go to Saudi. And he told me, Hassan, you are not welcomed in the Middle East. So I said, okay. I trust him very much. And he said, Hassan, you worked in the Middle East. You worked in the West. You go East. Then when you come to Saudi, you have a lot of respect. From Saudi Aramco, being a Saudi. And he said, look, I don't know if you're going to like the move, but it's very important for me. I said, yes, go ahead. And he said, I have one location under the Middle East and Asia, which is under him, that is negative. 
losing money. If I want to fix it, I'm going to send my soldier to fix it. So you go fix it. I said, okay. And I went to Malaysia. Actually, not Malaysia. A city in the west of Malaysia. It's called Kamaman. And of course, the message I want to tell you here, this city doesn't exist in the map. Okay? My predecessor went from training manager to the manager of Saudi, which is big, of that department. His predecessor went from training manager to the manager of China. And Mr. Black Sheep, go to a nun. So what happens is you get so much calls from your colleagues saying, Chief, is it demotion? Why did you accept? Why did you go? Why, 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 why? Everybody looks at things only negative. No matter how much you work hard, how much you do, there will be someone who looks at things negative. And it's up to you. You want to listen or ignore? If you're going to listen to everyone, you're just going to be demotivated all the time. Because no matter how good you're doing and how much things you... There is always negativeness. And I advise this is one thing you should not. Now, what helped me is I trusted, because I told the guys, I told them, he told me he wants to sell his soldier, that means I'm, I'm his soldier, I'm, you know, all of this. And they said, there's all the blah, blah, managers. Now, if I listen to them, I have missed a golden opportunity. I have been running a loss business. Loss, negative. So, everyone thinking I'm going to come, fire people. Do this, do that, stop ordering, no MS, no inventory, stop everything. So I went there. So, point number one that I wanted to pass in this message is don't listen to negativeness sometimes. Even though it's the picture in front of you and from your experience, it's a bad move. You always have to be positive. So, anyway, I went there, and there is two things. One that is very, very important when you're a manager. You have one person who's very good. You trust one or two. What happens is you dump so much work on them, and you burn them, and the rest are having fun. Not their fault. They might be good. They might be very good, but you just didn't give them the, the opportunity. What happens is the people you trust get very demotivated, overworked, and the others, you know, it's not their fault they didn't give them the work. So distributing work to everyone is very essential. And if, if someone doesn't work, then you take an action. But when I went there, this is the first thing I found out. One or two guys working day and night, not given the right training, not doing anything, and they're doing everything. And others, it's not their fault, they're good. But the chief was giving only the work to this person. All of the responsibility here, everything here, everything here. And some of them are not capable of doing that. But he trusts, the, the guy is good, the guy is very good. But what happens is, you have a very demotivating organization. You have a, a good guy who's overworked, very tired. And you have his colleagues who are envying him because he's the one who's trusted. Let aside they're good or bad. Let's say they're good. They're all good. I always believe there's nothing called everyone, someone bad. If you give the chance, then you live. But it, the, just bad is not, doesn't work this way. The third thing that I learned in, in Malaysia is I love sports. I love sports so much that I think I'm in the wrong business. I should be in the sports business, not the oil and gas business. So what I did, unintentionally, is I used to go out and play football with my team. In Malaysia, they have the futsal, the five against five, right? And we used to rent this place for, uh, for uh, you know, two hours a week. And I became two hours today, and then I chose a couple of days, so we played more. And what happened, what I realized, unintentionally, that is very, very strong is when your relationship with your team outside of work 
Now, I was in a losing business. So there's a lot of things that you need to know that you don't know, and nobody will tell you. And I was getting the, the, the stories and the ideas and the problems while playing football. You know, when you finish and you sit down drinking, you know, water, or uh, they have this uh, sugar, red sugar with water. Everyone is sitting down and relaxed. And everybody's opening up and talking. And you start understanding. It was not intentional. I'm not saying it was intentional. I was smart to think that this is the way I'm going to get information, but it worked. I realized my relationship with my team was beyond a relationship of a manager to an employee. We play football, you know, we make jokes, you know, we say Kubri, you know, when you, when you shoot the ball below, below the two legs, we, we make fun of each other usually, you know. So when they make fun of you, imagine when you start making fun of your manager from a soccer and football, you're at the level that they don't see that, that barrier between you and your manager, right? So then you sit down and you talk and, 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 and go over problems and why this and why that. And they will talk. They just open the books. No? It's just the message I wanted to say is the relationship with your employees doesn't end the day you leave the office. And it doesn't mean that you have to drink coffee or tea. There is, I think, sports is something that really opens doors. You don't have to know how to play sports to do that. But I'm saying the relationship after that, after working hours, is very, very essential. And again, it's not only one or two person. The relationship with all of your team, all of the organization. Not one or two. After uh, Malaysia, back to Saudi. First time to Saudi, I was a manager of one of the departments. And uh, Saudi is big. That time, Saudi was the highest revenue and net for Shlomajir worldwide. I used to comp my department used to compete with Aberdeen every once in a while. Every month, how much did you make? How much I made? I make more than you. You make more than me. I, I beat you this month. Anyway, two, a couple of things. One story that I really wanted to say here is, I have a lot, but the time is the, the essence. So the last story, hopefully the last, last two stories, one in Saudi and one in Paris, which is very important. In Saudi, what happened is, in Shlambajay, you have a, an organization that works five weeks, five weeks. Five weeks at the field, five weeks home. These, this population are usually experienced. They're usually 15, 20, 25 years experience. We have people from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from Egypt, from Algeria, all over. So when I arrived, I realized that they work five weeks, and then after the five weeks, they stay but they take double bonus. So for example, they take $200 a day, it becomes $400 a day. And then what happens, they stay over, and if they go back home, they spend not five weeks, they spend one week and come back. Not because they want to, it's just we had so much work. So much work that you, you could not cope. At least that's what my team was telling me. The managers below me were saying that we could not cope and we have to call them back. So overnight, now of course when I was the training manager in Dubai, I knew most of these people because I was taking care of Middle East and Asia. I was in charge of promotion, so I knew a lot of this field population. So I went and I told my managers below me, no more double bonus. Cut double bonus. There is nothing called, it was something that we did local in Saudi. It's not something that is standard for Shlomo that we do double bonus. No double bonus. So the, the supervisors, the experienced ones came to me. Hassan, do you have a minute? I mean, three, four supervisors who know me before, two from Indonesia and one from Malaysia. And they said, Hassan, you know, my manager is lying to me. He says, you cut the bonus. I know he's the one who cut the bonus. <laughs> I said, the problem, Chief, is me who cut the bonus. He said, you cut the bonus? I said, yes, I cut the bonus. Why did you cut the bonus, Hassan? I told them, Chief, you're old. You're not young. You spend... Five weeks on, five weeks off. That means already half of the year you're away from your kids. Now you want to reduce that half of the year more and don't see your kids? He looked at me. I said, what's going to happen to your kids? They're going to grow. They're going to get married. And all they know is you're the cash cow. That's it. No relationship. You know, he looked at me and I said, I didn't cut my bonus to hurt you. 
I cut the bonus to make sure you go home. Because when you go home and spend time with the family, when you come here in the middle of the sea or middle of the desert, you're beefed up, you're pumped up, you're okay, you're positive. Home is under control. But if you're not spending time with home, chief, you're always down. And what I realized, I mean, I did it for good intention. But I realized when your team sees that you care, I cut their salary, I cut the bonus. I cut something that comes to the pocket. But when they realized that you're doing it for their own sake, I tell you, it's beyond normal. Beyond normal. After Saudi, I went and worked the same office of the CEO. I was the head of training for Schlumberger Worldwide. And the point here, again, due to time, I need to go fast. No matter what happens in your career, I assure you, you cannot have the full cake. You want to have the best job, the best salary, the best uh, you know, team, the best uh, whatever, car, best everything, best, 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 best. You have to let go. The cake cannot be all except if God wants. That's something out of my hand. But in general, you cannot have the whole cake. And you have to accept. You have to know, okay, this I'll let go. So when I went to Paris, I was expecting my second baby. And when my wife went to, to the hospital to get the, you know, part of the requirements to get the permit to live in Paris, to get, they call it car de sujo, you have to do an x-ray. So they gave me a paper to sign. And I said, what is this paper? I didn't read French. So we had someone with us. They said, this is a paper that says, your wife is pregnant. So we do x-ray. If anything, if anything happens to the baby, you're called. Don't come to us. So I said, no. No way. So they said, well, uh, then she cannot get the, cannot get the permit, iqama uh, or the car de sujo. I sat with my wife. This was literally two months when I arrived to Paris. So I sat with my wife. Paris is the best place to be with your family. It's the city of romance, no? And we decided that my wife is not going to be with me. So she went back to Saudi. And I stayed in Paris alone for, for almost a year and a half. And the message I wanted to say, sometimes you have to take decisions like this. Sometimes you have to understand what benefits for you and your family. And you need to take decisions that you cannot have the whole cake. I could have went to the company and said, look, you know, I love this job. Thank you very much. But if my family is not with me, I'm, I need to go to another job. Some people, they use their, because they're good, they use their, their, uh, their strength because of this. They say... I will go and work the training, and I do, I, I'm the training for Middle East and Asia. I can do this job from Saudi. And I have a strong argument if I do this, by the way. But you have to understand, the benefit is not of the job. The benefit is you're sitting next to the CEO of Schlumberger Worldwide. The person who, if he says anything, that can, you know, it go, the stock goes up and down. Is the number one company worldwide in upstream oil and gas. You sit with next to him and you see how he takes decisions, how he develops, how he puts strategies, how he takes a decision at, Rosa, you know, at uh, the Eiffel Tower, go right, how the troops down, go right, not left. All of this, people pay money. I, know, I didn't know this. One of my friends said, Hassan, people pay money to do this, to sit next to CEO and learn. So I could have found my way not to stay in Paris and stay in Saudi with my wife. And I have a genuine reason. But all I'm saying is, you cannot have the whole cake. If you always want the whole cake, you will miss a lot of things. I had to decide that, no, this time, I have to... Uh, okay, my wife, she, we both agreed that she'll go to Saudi. I'll stay in Paris. She used to come on vacations every once in a while. And goes back in, in and out, in and out. But it worked very, very well. And then I came back to Saudi. Came back to Saudi as the, 
as the Vice President for Shlumberger, taking care of all the 16 companies for Saudi and Bahrain. Today, Saudi Aram in Shlumberger in Saudi is the biggest location for Shlumberger worldwide. Is, Saudi Aramco is the number one client for us. It's very proud, being a Saudi, that you serve your country at the end of the day. You see young Saudis coming in, you develop Saudis. You, now, of course, we have Saudis, we have non-Saudis, and you have to develop all. But you know, you, you tour the world and you come back and you try to do whatever you can to do to make sure the country and, and, the, and the whole organization goes up. To conclude very fast, so I touched on most of this, so I'll just skim over them for very fast, but the last two maybe some points that I'll go. So know your team, support the team, spend time with the team, and make sure you give them credit. The manager will get the credit by default. If your team does good and everybody appraises them, the manager by default you get the credit. You don't have to say, I did. And there is nothing better of getting your team credit in front of everyone. You as a manager, you will get the credit. Don't worry about it. You're the manager. If things you know, sink, you'll sink with it as well, you know, so it's, it goes both ways. But I'm saying the credit, you don't need to say, I did. As long as the team did good, by default is the leadership. The manager will get the credit. Make time to explain your decisions as the manager. Manage expectation, if you recall, the employee in Pakistan that I told him to get promoted. So make sure you manage expectation and you follow up on your promises. Distribute work. This is very lethal. If you give work only to one or two or three and, or, and leave the others, it's very difficult to have the whole cake, was, was the last message. Ego is very lethal. Sometimes you need it, but you know, ego is something that you really have to watch out. I always tell my, my team and my employees, ego, you fold, back pocket, forget about it. My advice, this is what I tell my team usually. The last thing that is very, very important. We all are going to end up in a hole that is two meter by one meter. All of us, and I think all of us agree to this. There is nothing better leaving a good memory. People remember you with positive, good things. And smile doesn't cost you anything. Doesn't cost you anything. Thank you.